Okay, so I'm going to talk to you through one question from my section of the course, which is taken from the 2012 paper. And this is question four, and we're going to look at part A, which is one of the options that you could have answered. The first question is asking you to draw the following orbitals, 2s, 2pz, 3d, x squared minus y squared, and 3dz squared. The question also asks you to show the axes and the relative phases using plus or minus signs. So this last part is very important. If you want to achieve full marks, then it's no good just drawing a circle for the 2s orbital. You really must show the axes for each of the orbitals and you must show the plus and minus signs. So if we have a look at now exactly what we would draw out, we'd be drawing our s orbital with the axes shown in this way and we can label the axes obviously z, x and y and we're asked to show the sign so that just has a positive sign as shown here so for the 2pz orbital obviously we've got our 2pz orbital looks like this again we need to show it's 2pz so show our axes so that must be lying along the z axis which I'm going to put in that direction shown there We'll also draw out the other axes as well. So there's our X and there's our Y. We must remember to put these signs there. So it specifically asked you to use minus and plus. We just put a plus in one lobe and a minus in the other lobe. Now obviously you're aware that you can draw P orbitals just shading one half and not shading the other half. But for this question, because it's specified using plus or minus signs to get full marks, you'd be expected to draw it as shown here. And if we move on, the question also asked us to do the 3dz squared orbital. Again, dz squared, you need to learn what the orbitals look like. The 3dz squared has this sort of shape with a kind of donut going around. Again, using signs, we could perhaps have this area as plus and this area as minus. Again, we want to show that that's going along the z axis, but we can draw in our other axes as well. Now obviously if you assign the z-axis as along here then that would be fine but you'd need to be drawing your dz orbital along this axis shown here. So just make sure you draw the orbital along the axis that you need to. And the other one was the 3d x squared minus y squared. So that's going to lie in the xy plane. So if we draw our z-axis again in this direction so we need to draw our axes for our x and y and our 3d x squared minus y squared that essentially lies along the x y axis and again you'd need to show plus minus plus minus so if you incorporate all of that information then you'd be able to obtain the full four marks if you missed off the plus or minus signs or labelled your axes wrong or didn't label your axes, then obviously you wouldn't achieve the full marks. Next question asks us to sketch and label the molecular orbital diagram, the MO diagram of H2, indicating the shapes of the orbitals. And you can see that it's worth three marks. So let's see how we would go ahead and answer that. So this is part two. To sketch our MO diagram for H2, so we've got MO of H2. We know for hydrogen, we've obviously got a 1s orbital on each hydrogen atom, and we want to overlap them to form our H2 molecule. So you want to indicate what atoms are being used to then form your molecule, which in this case is H2. So obviously hydrogen's only got a 1s orbital, so we'd be drawing out the 1s orbital energy level shown here. Obviously it's a homonuclear diatomic, so they're of the same energy level. Now remember these are just schematics, they're not to scale in any way. So we're just indicating that they start at the same level. We want to indicate that energy is increasing in this direction. And the orbitals that are formed from overlapping our 1s orbitals form the lower energy sigma bonding orbital and our higher energy sigma star antibonding orbital. And we normally link up the atomic orbitals to our molecular orbitals to show which orbitals we use to form your molecular orbitals. So we're part of the way there, but remember you should also include the number of electrons. Each hydrogen has one electron in its 1s orbital, 
and so therefore we have two electrons to put into our sigma bonding orbital and so they fill up the lower energy orbital. The question also asked you to show the shapes of the molecular orbitals. Essentially what we need to draw out is our sigma and sigma star. So if we show the shape for sigma to begin with, that's obviously the constructive, if you like, in-phase overlap of our two 1s orbitals. So adding them together, we form our bonding molecular orbital, which is labelled sigma. And that's the sort of shape that we'd be looking at where we have our bonding lower energy constructive interference. Our sigma star orbital, though, is our outer phase combination. So if you take one of the hydrogen atoms with the positive sign of the wave function, the other hydrogen atom is going to be negative sign of the wave function. And this is obviously destructive interference, and so we end up with a nodal plane and form our sigma star orbital. Again, you need to be careful that you show the signs of the wave function as positive and negative with a nodal plane in the middle, form your antibonding orbital. So this is our bonding, and our sigma star is our antibonding. Okay, so that's essentially all the information that would be required from A part 2. So if we go back to the question, the next question is asking us, using the molecular orbital diagram from part 2, so that's the diagram we've just drawn for H2, explain which molecular ion, H2+, plus or H2-, minus, has the stronger hydrogen-hydrogen bond, and that's worth two marks. The way to answer this, therefore, the easiest way, really, is to work out the bond order. So we've got the two different ions. We've got H2 plus and H2 minus. So let's work out our bond order. The bond order for H2 plus is going to be equal to, let's just have a look back at our molecular orbital diagram. Well, if we've got H2 plus, we must have taken away, ionized away, one of these electrons. So therefore, there would only be one electron remaining in the bonding orbital, and you can see that the antibonding would still be empty. So our bond order, remember, is equal to the number of electrons in the bonding orbital minus the number of electrons in the antibonding orbital divided by 2. So we've got one electron in our bonding orbital, because it's H2+, plus, minus 0, because there's no electrons in our antibonding orbitals, and then divide that by 2. And so the bond order would therefore be 0.5 or a half. What about H2 minus? Let's go back up to the molecular orbital diagram. So H2 minus, we're going to need to add an electron. The next available orbital is our sigma star orbital, so the extra electron will go into the sigma star orbital. Our bond order now is going to be equal to 2, because we've still got our two electrons in our bonding orbital, minus 1, because we've now got one in the sigma star orbital, and again divided by 2. That would also be 0.5. And so if you recall, the question was asking us, using the MO diagram for part 2, explain which molecular ion H2 plus or H2 minus has the stronger hydrogen-hydrogen bond. Now, from the bond order, it's very difficult to conclude which would have the stronger bond because they've both got a bond order of 0.5. So we can say both H2 plus and H2 minus have the same bond order, but if we think about it, H2 minus has one electron in a sigma star orbital, and this is an antibonding orbital, which is obviously at higher energy, so H2- minus would be expected to have a weaker and longer bond length than, obviously, H2+. Plus. OK, so from the bond order, we weren't able to conclude which would have the stronger hydrogen-hydrogen bonds, but based on where the electrons would go into the molecular orbital diagram, because H2- minus has to have an additional electron in our antibonding orbital, that's of higher energy, so we'd therefore expect that it would have a weaker and longer hydrogen-hydrogen bond length than we would observe in H2+, where all the electrons would be in the bonding orbital. And that would give us our two marks, so a mark perhaps from working out the bond order and a mark for stating the fact that H2- minus has a longer bond length because of the electron going into the antibonding orbital. So the next part of the question was asking us to sketch and label the molecular orbital diagram of HCl, indicating the character of each of the resulting molecular orbitals, and that's worth six marks. 
key to answering this question is actually drawing out a clearly labelled molecular orbital diagram. Now it's very important that this is drawn out nice and clearly. You don't want it all scrunched up really small because you want to be able to achieve maximum marks where you know I can see that all the different levels are labelled clearly. So we're going to overlap hydrogen with chlorine to form our HCl. Let's think about what orbitals we'd have available. Hydrogen, we've obviously got a 1s1, and chlorine, our valence orbitals are going to be 3s2 and 3p5. Okay, so now we're looking at heteronuclear diatomic, so we have to think about the ordering of the orbitals. Now, chlorine is an electronegative atom, and so its effective nuclear charge is high, so we find that the orbitals are going to be lower in energy than those for the hydrogen atom. So our 3s orbital, let's start here. Remember, this is a, just a sketch. We're not doing anything to scale. And then let's put our 3p orbitals for chlorine. And then our hydrogen is 1s orbital is going to be higher in energy, so we can put it up here. Now, when it comes to overlap to actually form our orbital, so you'd need to relate this to in the lectures I showed you about HF, so it's going to be very similar. We could assume that largely the 3S are going to be non-bonding, they're a little bit too low in energy to have overlap with our 1S orbital. We can put the electrons in as well, we can put one in the 1S and also we've got two in our 3S and five in our 3P orbitals as shown here. So we can assume that the 3S is largely non-bonding, low in energy. If you wanted to, you could show that it was weakly bonding, but our main bonding that's going to occur is between the 1s and the 3p's orbital, and we'll form a sigma bonding orbital from overlap of 1s and 3p's. But recall, if you any atomic orbitals that you put in, you must form the same number of molecular orbitals, so we're overlapping 1s and 3pz to form sigma. We must also be forming a sigma starred orbital as well is going to go higher in energy. So we have 3px and 3py remaining and they would be largely non-bonding as shown here. So these will be our 3px, 3py. Again, energy is going to go in this direction. Okay, and we start putting electrons in. So these are largely non-bonding, so they'll go down, remain in the 3s orbitals. We then have six electrons to fill up, starting with our lowest energy, so two in the sigma and two in our 3py and 3px. Now the question asked, indicating the character of each of the resulting molecular orbital diagrams. So by drawing this molecular orbital diagram, showing the different atoms, getting roughly the ordering of the atomic orbitals in comparison to each other, then showing the molecular orbitals, the energy, labelling these all clearly, so this needs to be a 3S, then that would probably achieve you around four marks. So the remaining two marks would come from describing the character of the different orbitals. So we could say that our overlap of the hydrogen 1S orbital and chlorine 3PZ orbital results in the formation of the sigma bonding, sigma star antibonding orbital. Then we'd need to also specify that the chlorine 3S orbital is a largely non-bonding MO and the chlorine 3PX and 3PY orbitals are non-bonding high molecular orbitals. This is the sigma for the 3S. So let's just go back to the question and check we've answered everything, indicating the character of each of the resulting molecular orbitals. Okay, so we have done that because we've clarified that our bonding is largely taking place between our 1S and 3PZ. So our 1S on hydrogen, 3PZ on chlorine to form your sigma and sigma star. And then we've explained what happens with 3S, 3PY and 3PX on chlorine. We've illustrated that these are largely non-bonding orbitals as we'd expect. So our next question asks us to use the molecular orbital diagram from part 4 to calculate the bond order of HCl and that's worth two marks. Okay, so let's go back to our molecular orbital diagram so we can answer part 4. Remember, bond order is equal to the number of bonding electrons minus the number of antibonding electrons divided by 2. These electrons in 3s and also 3px and 3py are all non-bonding orbitals. So we don't need to include those in our calculation of our bond order. 
The only bonding electrons we have are these two electrons in our sigma orbital, and you can see that we have no sigma star bonding orbitals at all. So for part 5, our bond order is therefore going to be 2, because we've got two electrons in our sigma orbital, minus 0, because we've got none in the antibonding, divided by 2, and so our bond order is 1, which is obviously what you would expect a single bond in HCl. So there's just one part left to look at, and that's explain how the molecular orbital diagrams of H2 and HCl provide further information on the bond polarities in each case. Right, so let's think about this. How would we go about answering this question? Earlier we looked at the MO diagram for H2, and both H2 and HCl have a bond order of 1. However, H2 is a homonuclear diatomic, whereas HCl is a heteronuclear diatomic. If we think about it, for H2, the two interacting 1s orbitals are of the same energy and simply overlap to form a sigma bonding and sigma star antibonding molecular orbital, forming a hydrogen-hydrogen covalent bond. What about for HCl? Obviously our valence orbitals are hydrogen, we have 1s, chlorine we have 3s and 3p. So the more electronegative atom is chlorine, so we expect the 3s and 3p orbitals of Cl to be lower in energy than the 1s orbital of hydrogen. And so with a polar covalent bond of HCl, I'm sure you'd all be happy to write hydrogen delta plus, Cl delta minus, is formed from overlap of hydrogen 1s orbital and chlorine 3pz orbital. The other valence orbitals on Cl remain non-bonding. Okay, starting with different energy levels leads to a less simple covalent bond like we see in H2. Instead, we get a polar covalent bond where the um, electrons are obviously more localised on the more electronegative atom, which is chlorine. That essentially then answers all of the questions, and that's what you'd expected. You can choose either part A or B, and I've illustrated part B to you here.